title of our lesson today is Faith, Hope, and Love. Now, when we talk about faith, we're not going to talk about all the faithful to the patriots who believe they're going to complete an undefeated season today. When we talk about hope, we're not talking to all the giant fans who are hoping for one of the most unbelievable upsets in Super Bowl history. Let's turn to that famous passage in 1 Corinthians 13. In verse 4, love is patient, love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud, it is not rude, it's not self seeking, it's not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. And then in verse 13, and now these three remain. Faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. You know, these three qualities, if you were to pick out any three qualities, describe our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. They also are the requirements in order to respond to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so today we have three simple points. Number one, an unworthy super faith. Number two, an unexpected super hope. And number three, an unpretentious super love. Let's go to our text in Luke chapter 7. We read in verse 1. This is right after Jesus had finished one of the most famous of his sermons, the Sermon on the Mount. When Jesus had finished saying all this in the hearing of the people, he entered Capernaum. Now, a lot of people don't know this. They think that Jesus just kind of meandered around for three years going from this village to that village. But in truth is, his main residence was in Capernaum. And so he would go out and visit different cities and preach, but he would always end up back in Capernaum. And so we read on. There a centurion servant, whom his master valued highly, was sick and about to die. The centurion heard of Jesus and sent some of the elders of the Jews to him, asking him to come and to heal his servant. When they came to Jesus, they pleaded earnestly with him. This man deserves to have you do this because he loves our nation and has built our synagogue. So Jesus went with him. Right here we find the centurion, a, a Roman legionnaire, a Gentile, a leader of a hundred men, a century, a centurion, calls upon Jesus for help. Now this was just not any centurion. The Bible gives us a little bit of insight right here. Number one, he had a relationship with the elders of the Jews. And number two, the Bible says right here, is that all the Jews felt that this man really loved the Jewish people and in fact it helped to build the synagogue. A lot of people don't understand, but in the Jewish mindset there were two kinds of proselytes or converts. One was called a proselyte of the gate. The other was called a proselyte of righteousness. The proselyte of the gate was just very simply someone who believed in what the Jews believed in, accepted Jehovah God, and lived within their walls, lived within their gates, as referenced in Deuteronomy 14 and 24. The proselyte of righteousness was the one that accepted circumcision. And so this was the person that really sold on out for God. <laughs> well, right here we have every indication that the centurion was a lover of God. He was a proselyte of the gate. And the Bible says, in reference to him, that he had built their synagogue. Here's a very interesting piece from archaeology. If you go to the city of Capernaum today, you will find the remains, the ruins, of a beautiful white marble synagogue built in the first century. Is that awesome or not? And that's what this beloved centurion 
had wanted to do. Well, he has this servant, when actually it's translated in the Greek, slave. He has this very valued slave. And of course, that shows the heart of this man to love his slave with this much empathy that he really wants to get the most help he can. And so he asked the Jewish elders for some help to get Jesus. They persuade Jesus. And Jesus is, in fact, coming to this man's house to heal his servant. And so we read on. Jesus was not far from the house when the centurion sent friends to say to him, Lord, don't trouble yourself. For I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. That is why I do not even consider myself worthy to come to you. But you say the word and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, and he goes. And that one, come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him. And turning to the crowd following him, he said, I tell you, I have not found such great faith even in all Israel. Then the men who had been sent returned to the house and found the servant well. Is that awesome or not? You know, it's very interesting that while Jesus was heading on his way to the centurion's home to heal his servant, the centurion thought, you know something, that's, that's just really not necessary. The elders of the city said, hey, Jesus, this man deserves your help. But the centurion takes the message to Jesus through some other people. He says, listen, I don't deserve to have you come under my roof. You know, there are a lot of people today that think they deserve the blessings of God. This, this centurion fully understood he deserved nothing. And he sent the message back to Jesus. Jesus, it's really not necessary for you to come to my house because I understand, I understand who you are and I understand what you're all about. He says, I'm a centurion. I'm a man under authority. I take commands from people over me. And I also give commands to the soldiers that are under me. I say to one soldier, go, and he goes. I say to another one, do this, and he does it. I say to that one, come, and he comes. Jesus turns this whole crowd that was following. He says, I have not found such great faith in all Israel. And when the servants that had taken the message of Jesus returned to the centurion's house, they found the servant healed. Amen? Amen? You know, we see in this man an unworthy super faith. An unworthy super faith. And I've really got to challenge us. Is this the kind of faith that we have? When Jesus says go, do we trust God so much? that we're going to obey him immediately and go. When Jesus says, come, do we trust God? And we immediately come. When he says, do this, do we trust God? And do we immediately do this? Now, for some of the old timers in the crowd, there's, there's an old song that has a choral refrain that goes, trust and obey. For there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Are you with me right here, guys? And that song has, has all the truth in it from this passage right here. You've got to trust and obey. And that's what it really means to have a great faith. Well, let's take a couple of tests right here. You know, one of the most famous passages that has the word go in it is Matthew chapter 28, verse 19. Go and make disciples of all nations and baptize them. Amen, guys? You know, we have a sister in the church. I know that we all admire very, very, very much. Her name is Angelica Robles. And uh, Angelica called me up yesterday. She was just so excited. I'm just so excited. I'm so excited. I said, what are you excited about? <laughs> well, let's just say that Angelica is a little bit over 30 years old. And she's going to Cal State LA to complete her degree. And yesterday at Cal State LA, Hillary Clinton was speaking. Now, Angelica isn't into politics a lot. And maybe you are, maybe you aren't. But she said, you know something? There's a reason I'm going to Cal State LA, and there's a reason this lady has come to speak here at this school, and I am going to go hear this woman because tomorrow is Super Sunday at my church. Well, lo and behold, the Lord picked out for her a front row seat. After Hillary got done, she boldly came on up because what? She trusted and obeyed, and she asked Hillary to come to church. 
You may be a Hillary fan, and you go, amen. And you may not be a Hillary fan, and you go, amen. Let's face it, either way, she needs to come to church. Amen, guys. <laughs> Now, here's the thing. You know, she, she boldly shared her faith, and then she found a friend that was in uh, one of the, 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 the groups that, that Hillary was a part of. And she says, you know, one of the things I do, uh, and Helica makes dresses. And she's made dresses for a lot of famous ladies. And she says, can you take word back uh, to Mrs. Clinton that, that I make dresses? And I like to make her a dress. So, lo and behold, this guy went on back, told Hillary about it, And then Hillary came back to Angelica. <laughs> and she says, listen. If I win the primary, you can make me a dress. And then Angelica invited her out again. I got a question for you. Do people intimidate you? Or do you have an unworthy super faith? That when God says go, you go. You invite people out no matter their stature, no matter their position, no matter their prestige, because you know that they need Jesus Christ. You know, another very famous scripture is in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. Jesus, come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. You know, if we really have an unworthy super faith, we'll come. Now, sometimes we come because there are certain forces that are upon our lives. I, I will never forget back about... Nine months ago at an inaugural service. And uh, this, I don't know if I want to say young couple. It's hard to say that about Lou Jack and Kathy. But this, this, this couple came on in. And uh, you, you, you know, they, they'd come to the first service. That was awesome. But you can always tell, you know, when a couple has just had a fight. A lot of times the sister's wearing sunglasses because she's been crying. You know what I'm talking about? And, and, and the brother or the sister's walking about two steps in front. You know, have you ever been there? No. And, and Luis had been a little bit up in the air about visiting the church. You know, if you don't know, we're a little bit controversial. And Kathy says, listen, I want to go to a church where we got discipling and we're going to get help for our marriage. And it was her birthday, so Luis says, well, where do you want to go? I'm going to go to Kipolena's church. They, come on, they came on in, and they've never stopped coming. Because, you see, when you come back to the Lord, when you get into powerful discipling relationships, then there is rest for the weary. You know, I think about Chris Van Staten coming all the way from South Africa. That's crazy. That, that takes about a day and a half flying in order to get here to L.A. But that's how much he values being here and having the kind of fellowship and relationship with God that we really call people to have. And yet for a lot of us, going 30 minutes is too much. 45 minutes is too much. An hour and a half. Let me tell you something. There is nothing too much to find you a church that really preaches the Word of God and calls you to have a relationship with God where you will find rest for your weary soul. The centurion understood, go, come, and do this. You know, it's been exciting to see so many people baptized in, in the last several months here. One of the things that I always just see God working in, because I come from that background, I come from a very religious background. And sometimes when people see the truth of how to become a true Christian, it's a block to them because it's not how they were raised. Turn to Acts chapter 2. Come on, come on. In Acts 2, we find that after a group of thousands had heard Peter's gospel message, in verse 37 we read, When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Well, brothers, what shall we do? They came to a faith. And Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Verse 41. Those who accept this message were baptized. About 3,000 were added to the number that day. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. I mean, right here we see how the Bible teaches to become a true Christian. 
Yes, you have to start out with a faith. It's an adult decision. Then you got to repent. You got to turn from your life of darkness and turn to a life of light living as a disciple. Then you got to be water baptized. You got to be immersed for two reasons. One, the forgiveness of sins that gives you a relationship with God and the gift of the Holy Spirit which gives you the power to live the Christian life. And then after you baptize, you got to live it out. You got to be devoted to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to breaking bread and prayer. You know, one of the, 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 the young sisters that, that really inspired me because she came from a very religious background was uh, Dominique. And uh, Dominique had, had seen all sorts of different religious backgrounds and frankly the hypocrisy that goes on in, in so many churches. And yet the thing that was awesome about her faith as she began to deal with her heart, she already had a faith in Jesus, a deep faith in Jesus that her family had given her. But she'd never really dealt with her life. She'd never really let people on into all the hurt and the pain that sin brings upon us and other sins bring upon us. When she dealt with that, when she repented, then she was baptized. Why? Because the Bible simply said, do this. And she had the same kind of centurion's unworthy super faith. This is, well, if the Bible says repent and be baptized, who am I to argue? Because I'm going to trust and obey. For there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. How about it, guys? You see a scripture? Do you question it? Do you have suspicions? Do you wonder if it will work? How about it? Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and everything will be given to you as well. Or do you fear scriptures? Or do you embrace them? Our first challenge is you've got to see yourself as undeserving, unworthy, and you need to have a super faith Amen. where you trust and obey. On, Let's move on back in Luke chapter 7. Right, Come on. Come on. This, is, this is an unbelievable passage right here. Unexpected super hope. You know, the unexpected is, is amazing. <laughs> Keeps life exciting, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, that's right. You know, a few weeks ago, one of our brothers, uh, Mike Underhill, was with one of, one, one of the, the sisters, Melina, going through the uh, UCLA Botanical Gardens. And uh, I don't know what came over Mike, but he decided he wanted to feed the squirrels. So if you can picture Mike, he's out there feeding the squirrels these almonds. And Melina's just standing there and everything, and so he's feeding the the little squirrel and everything, and he's eating one almond too. And then something, Mike kind of jerked because he, he lost his attention on the little squirrel. And the squirrel, when it jerked, must have thought his thumb was an almond. <laughs> this squirrel didn't just nibble on Mike's I mean, it whacked down on it. Mike shrieks. He flicks the squirrel into the air. The squirrel lands on Melina's head. Then they had to go to the hospital to get his thumb fixed. That's unexpected. Now, unexpected can be good or it can be bad, but let's look at our text right here. <laughs> Chapter 7, verse 11. Soon afterwards, Jesus went to the town of Nain, and his disciples, a large crowd, went along with him. As he approached the town gate, a dead person was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. And a large crowd from the town was with her. When the Lord saw her, his heart went out to her and he said, Don't cry. Then he went up and touched the coffin and those carrying it stood still. He said, Young man, I said to you, get up. The dead man sat up and began to talk. And Jesus gave him back to his mother. They were all filled with awe and praise God. A great prophet has appeared amongst us, they said. God has come to help his people. This news about Jesus spread throughout Judea and the surrounding country. Certainly an unexpected super hope. If you can envision this passage for but a moment, we find that Jesus is coming towards the town of Nain. And he has a large group of people following him. 
Out of the town of Nain was another large group of people, but this was a funeral procession. It wasn't just any funeral. This was, this was one of heart-wrenching proportions. It was one where a mother, in fact a widow, had lost her only son. Wow. You know, in the natural order of life, it is usually common that we are forced to bury our parents. Life dictates that one spouse will bury the other. But it's quite uncommon for us to have to bury our children. And right here we find a woman that's been left all alone. She's a widow. And now her only son has died. Can you imagine the grief, the pain, the hurt, the anguish? And right as she's coming on out, perhaps leaving the procession, this other crowd is coming with Jesus. And Jesus, knowing everything that was going on, the Bible says in verse 13, I love it, his heart went out to her. And he said, don't cry. You know what I think happened when he said don't cry? The people didn't cry. They knew something unexpected would be happening. This was the carpenter turned preacher. This was the guy that was healing people all around. And the Bible says, and we kind of miss it, that he goes up and touches the coffin and those carrying it stood still. Now, coffin's probably a poor translation right here because the Jews didn't use one. They used more of a stretcher. And they cover the body in linen with a cloth over the face. And Jesus just simply speaks to the young man on the stretcher in the presence of the crowd that was with him and the mourning crowd that was with the mom. Young man, I say to you, get up! And then, I mean, it probably freaked everybody. He just sits right on up. <laughs> but the Bible then says, and then he began to talk. Now that would have done it for me right there. <laughs> and then the most cool thing, I, I think that it says that Jesus gave him back to his mom. Perhaps he was a little bit younger and he had to be helped off the stretcher. I mean, every movement, every word, every action of Jesus was filled with faith, hope, and love. And what, what were the people feeling? They were all filled with awe and praise God. And he said, God has come to help his people. You see, one of the most painful things that we have to face is death. I know in my own family, whenever someone would have to come on over to the house to deal with gravestones or insurances or something to this effect, mom would make herself scarce. She didn't want to be there to talk about death. A lot of people like that. You know, it really hit me the other day. I was just looking on the internet. And Heath Ledger had died, 28 years old. Wow, I don't know why it just hit me. I mean, he'd been on, in, in The Patriot, and perhaps his most famous film was Brokeback Mountain. But here's a young man, 28 years old, with incredible fame, incredible fortune. He'd just broken up with the girl that he was living with. He had a two-year-old daughter, Matilda. And here he is, dead, at 28, most likely of sleeping pills and partying with drugs. In the world's eyes, he had everything. And yet there was an emptiness that all the evil this world tries to anesthetize us with and all the good in this world of relationships and family, none of it could fill the void. That God vacuum in his life. You know, whenever tragedy strikes our family, it's even more devastating. I'll never forget, and I'm so appreciative of the church praying so hard for Bob, 
who had a massive stroke just a couple of months ago. He's doing so much better. But it just hits you. I mean, here's my little sister and her husband's got this stroke that, that killed one-eighth of his brain. You know, I started to, to think about this. I mean, Jesus, above all, wants to give us hope. And the area of hope that he most gives us hope in is our families. I mean, think about this reunion that takes place right here. As I thought about the congregation over the last several months, I, I see the Spirit moving so powerfully within our church family, within our physical families. I mean, it's been, it's, it's been incredible. According to Malachi chapter 4, a sign of God's kingdom would the children would return to their fathers and fathers would be returned to their children. You know, how exciting. Right at the beginning of the church when Rob and Burgundy on Achaia rededicate their lives. Because they'd seen that they'd really messed up as parents. And then two weeks later, their teenage son, Darian, is baptized into Christ. How exciting when Lance and Connie Underhill, who are totally in debt and challenged up in Portland, say, listen, bro, we want to be on the mission team to go down to Los Angeles because our son, Mike, who used to be in the full-time ministry, has fallen away. He's a bartender, and he's living with his girlfriend. And we know the only hope is a church that's filled with love and hope and faith. And we want to be there to help him. Mike was restored. Amen. It's so exciting to see families like Victor and Sonia Gonzalez seeing Easy and Sonia restored to the Lord. Amen. And then Miracle, Miracle, Salute was baptized. Amen. I mean, exciting to see Ron Harding be able to restore his mom, Judy. Yeah. To see Lou Jack and Kathy influence Kathy's mom and dad, Tommy and Sandra, to be restored to the Lord. Yeah. See, just a couple of weeks ago, Ted Green's son, Joe, baptized into Christ. Yeah. And then, I mean, so moving was, was Dave Swan. Yeah. Dave, Dave was married before and had Kyle and Cassie with his first marriage. And these kids have been around the kingdom for years, and then their lives drifted away. They got so estranged from Dave. And yet the Holy Spirit moved. And Kyle and Cassie got baptized in Christ. Amen? I mean, then to think about Paula Foley, who's just barely hanging on to having just a little bit of faith. And then, miracle, miracle, Michaela gets baptized in Christ. I think about Jack and Jeannie McGee who get restored and then their son Jared is baptized into Christ. And then just the past couple of weeks, I mean the miracles with the young families has been incredible. Luis Ramos gets baptized and a week later Irma joins him, his wife. And then later, later Garcia got baptized about four or five months ago and then just a couple of weeks ago her husband that nobody thought could come around all that quick, Ronnie got baptized into Christ. I mean it's incredible when you see God giving hope to the families. I dare say even today there are marriages that are in trouble here. There are parents who feel like they've lost control of their children. There are children that hate and despise their parents. But there's hope. But there's a challenge that goes with it. Jesus was able to convert his mom and his brothers. Acts chapter 1. But he did it in a way that shocks people. It's unexpected. One time when they were persecuting him, and yes, his mom and his brother persecuted him. Jesus, who is my mother and my brother and my sister? But those who obey the word of God. One of the most challenging teachings of true Christianity is the fact that God's family, God's spiritual family, must be placed at a higher priority than our physical family so that our physical family will join us in our spiritual family. That's what happened with Jesus. And that's what's happened with all of these people. If you would have talked to these people nine months ago, could their husband be baptized? Would they have been baptized? Would their children have been restored? They go, I have no hope. But God has blessed them with an unexpected 
super hope. You know, I, I was quite moved this morning. I didn't know when I walked in the auditorium that uh, Berta, Lloydie's mom, was going to be baptized. Now, from one point of view, Lloydie lives clear out in Palm Springs. And she's been all discouraged that there haven't been that many baptisms out there. Her mom lives all the way up in Enlil Valley. What hope is there? Well, there is God. Amen. And today, Berta is being baptized in the Christ. Amen. And mother and daughter are united. Let's finish on up in chapter 7. Our last point is an unpretentious super love. Beginning in verse 36. Now one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him. So he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. Now hold it. You just got to love this scene right here. You know, back in those days, you know how they ate? They ate laying down. Yeah. Is that the most cranking way to eat or not? Yeah. Now I know a bunch of you husbands, that's what you're going to be doing today. Honey, bring the chips, bring the salsa. No, I can't get up. Right in the middle of the play, babe. <laughs> I mean, when you have people serving you laying down, I mean, that's just... I mean, think about breakfast in bed. I mean, who doesn't love it? We need to bring back some of that culture, I think. I don't know. Let's get back to our text right here, guys. Okay, don't get too excited. Don't get too excited. Verse 37. When a woman who had lived in a sinful life in that town learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster jar of perfume. And as she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he'd know who's touching him and what kind of woman she is. She's a sinner. She said to him, Simon, I've got something to tell you. Oh, tell me, teacher, he said. Two men owed money to a certain money lender. One owed him 500 denarii. That's about $50,000. And the other 50 denarii, about $5,000. Neither of them had money to pay him back, so he canceled the debt of both. Now, which of them will love him more? So I replied, well, I, I suppose the one that had the bigger debt canceled. You judge correctly, Jesus said. Then he turned towards the woman and said, Simon, do you see this woman? I came into your house. You did not give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she's poured perfume on my feet. Therefore I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, for she loved much. But he who's been forgiven little loves little. Then Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. The other guests began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? She said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Is that cranking or not? You know, many people believe that this is Mary Magdalene. And, and perhaps it is. I lean towards that persuasion. But the, the text does not clearly identify that. I think one thing that stands out in this whole text for the centurion, the widow, and this sinful woman is that they are nameless. I believe there's a reason for being nameless. It's because there was an innate humility that each of them had. You have to be humble to have faith. Amen. You have to be humble to have hope. And you have to be humble to have love. We find very interestingly here that as perhaps just the men were eating reclined on the couches, there was a fairly large party that was going on. And this woman had snuck into the party. And perhaps at that particular time, pretty unnoticed. And she just kind of stood there at the feet of Jesus. Now, you know, I don't think that she just waltzed into that party. I mean, when she stood there at the feet of Jesus... For the first time in her life, she was in the presence of a totally pure man, and she started to cry. 
I think she probably stood out time for a while, not knowing where she could go in. You know, this uh, past week, Elena and I had the opportunity to go to Honolulu to preach to the church there. And we were very blessed to have the Bartholomews with us. And uh, on Friday morning last week, I said, hey, Kyle, let's go climb Diamond Head and let's pray up there. Now, if you've ever climbed Mount Hollywood here, this is much, 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 much steeper. And so Kyle and I started climbing Diamond Head. And Kyle started falling further and further behind. <laughs> and huffing and puffing just a little bit. And, and I saw this despair in his eyes. I said, brother, you can do it. You can make it to the top. I believe in you. You know... Whenever there's a hard task in front of us, you know, one of the things that hits us is self-doubt. Can I really do this? Can I really do this? I think that's how that woman was wrestling with outside of that home, knowing the party was going on, knowing that Jesus was there. She goes, can I really do this? And yet, by faith and hope and unpretentious love, she walks in, stands there with a jar of perfume in her hand, so moved by Jesus. She starts crying. The tears fall off of her cheeks, and unbeknownst to her at first, they fall on Jesus' feet. Well, then she, she looks down, she goes, oh, and in and, and, and horror, she, she just immediately reacts and, and bends down and begins to wipe his feet with her hair. And then she starts to kiss her feet in a sign of reverence and then pours the perfume for which she brought for him. My assumption at this point is that Simon's full attention's on this woman. And he's thinking to himself, I can't but this guy calls himself a prophet. Does he know what kind of woman this is? Everybody knew this woman. Does he know what kind of woman this is that's touching him? You know, it, it would really be cool to be Jesus and know everybody's thoughts. Yeah. Wow. And so, I, and, 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 and you know, the thing I love about Jesus, he's so cool, calm, and collective he puts the, where he puts the hammer down. And uh, so he's noticing Simon just kind of watching this woman out of the corner of his eyes. Just probably his face is getting just kind of tightened on up, just disfigured by his hate of this sinful woman. And he goes, Jesus goes, hey Simon, I got something to tell you. <laughs> then Simon tries to play cool. Yeah, tell me about it. He says, well, it's, it's a little, little preacher story. He says, well, go on. He says, well, there's a certain money lender. Yeah. And uh, two guys owed him money. One guy owed him $50,000. Nah. Yeah. <laughs> the other guy owed him five. Yeah, I can relate. <laughs> and then the guy forgave both of them. Get out of Dodge. <laughs> it's, it's just a story, Simon. It's just a story. <laughs> He said, but I got a question for you. Which of them loved him more? Now, Simon wasn't dumb, and so he goes, now Jesus is doing something right here. And so he goes, well, and it's right in the text. You go look at it. You go look at it. Verse, verse 43. Mm, I suppose the one that had the bigger debt canceled. You judged rightly, Simon. He says, see the woman? Of course, he'd been looking at it the whole time. You know, I came in your house. You didn't give me any water for my feet. She wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You didn't give me a kiss. This woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. 
You didn't give me any oil for my head. It's just customary. But she's poured perfume on my feet. Therefore I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven. For she loved much. But he who forgives little, loves little. And he said to her, your sins are forgiven. I find that kind of fascinating. He didn't say your many sins are forgiven. He said your sins are forgiven. And he just talked about two different guys that need their debt forgiven. Two different guys that need their sins forgiven. One that was forgiven much, that loved much. And one that was forgiven little, that therefore loved little. And he said, but your sins are forgiven. I think that was just a dagger to the heart right there. And then all the other guests go. Because I think by this time, everybody's kind of looking from their recliner. <laughs> Who is this guy who even forgives sins? And Jesus says, listen. Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. And don't we all long for that? Don't we long for that? You know, going to Hawaii was, was really awesome. It was an awesome chance. Elaine and I got away for our 31st wedding anniversary. That's pretty awesome. Amen? And uh, that, was, that was fantastic. We had a wonderful time, and I appreciate everybody's prayers. But you know, that absolutely wasn't the highlight, as awesome as that was. It was going to see what God is doing in the Hawaiian Islands. I mean, it really was incredible. It just brought back loads and, and, and loads of memories for me. My first time going to Hawaii was 1982, and it was my first trip around the world to survey different cities for churches. Went to Honolulu, Tokyo, Bombay, Paris, and London. And so the first stop was there in Hawaii in 1982. When I got there, there was a small group of people that were meeting in the mainline Church of Christ that were trying to practice discipling. And so I, I only had a day or two there, and so they wanted to meet with me, and so we, we met... And uh, we, we met at kind of in a Hawaiian Denny's called Zippy's. And it, it was about 11, 12 o'clock at night, but these guys really wanted it. And they met with me and said, Kip, we need a discipling church here in Honolulu. I said, you know something? We don't have anybody trained right now, but we got people training. I said, but what you guys need to do is you need to move to Boston. All eight of them moved to Boston. And then in 1989, we planted the church there, a discipling church in Honolulu, with about 20 disciples. And it just multiplied. I mean, anytime you have a base of sold out disciples, they're just going to multiply, aren't they? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Well, by the year 2000, the church had reached almost 1,000 disciples with almost 1,500 on Sundays. Not only was the church just blossoming there, but it sent churches out to Hilo, which is on the big island, as well as to Maui, another one of the islands, and to the far distant uh, island of Guam. Wow. Now, what's kind of cool for all of us from Portland is that one of the guys in that original group in 1982 that moved from Honolulu to Boston was Bob Bertolot, one of our elders. Of course, one of the guys that got converted in Guam was Tony Untalon, our other elder there. So we have a lot to be thankful for, for the church there in Hawaii. Amen, guys? But you know, over the past several years, a lot of the churches in our former fellowship have given up discipling, have given up the call to be totally committed. And so the churches have waned because there's no distinctiveness. And so it was about at this time that Kyle Bartholomew was asked to start leading the Hilo Church. Now, the Hilo Church's history was a pretty simple one. They had been started out of Honolulu, and just had a handful of disciples, and they grew to about 100 on Sundays. They had about 60 disciples. But when everything hid and the lack of commitment came into the churches and was accepted, then I asked Kyle, well, how many people are coming to church now? He says, well, on Sundays we're having about 35, 40. That includes the kids. I said, well, but how many are you having at midweek? Eh, 12 or 15. I said, bro, that's your real church right there. Come on. And so he asked us when he came to Jubilee, because he saw the church he was baptized in, he says, hey, can you and Elena come and disciple our church and help us build a church of sold-out disciples again? I said, well, you go back and talk to your leadership, and if they say yes, we'll come. So he went on back, talked to the Shepherding couples, they said yes, and so we came. But it was at that point that we began to get tremendous resistance and opposition from other churches. 
But Kyle and Joan and the shepherding couple stood firm, and after a week's worth of preaching, we had 12 disciples left. 12 sold out stuff. Now, you got to understand, the previous year, they hadn't had any baptisms. Once we had a base of 12 sold out disciples, in the next year and a half, there were 27 people baptized in Christ. Is that awesome? And now Kyle's brother, Evan, is leading the church. Well, that very weekend, there were two people that came from Honolulu, and they said, you know something, we've tried to change the church we're in. We've tried so hard, but it's not changing. What do we do? I said, well, I think you're supposed to have to start something new. So the two of them went back to Honolulu, Joe and Mary Santos. That's a cool name, Joseph and Mary. Amen. And they, they, they went back, and they started a new little church. Now, in a year and a half, they got 13 disciples. Is that awesome? Now, the week that we were there, we had the Hilo Church join the Honolulu Church there in Honolulu. And it was, it was incredible. I mean, the, the unity, the fellowship. And what was awesome on Sunday was not only was there a young lady, Alexis, that was baptized from Hilo. That was awesome. But there was a brother that was restored. This guy's name was Jody Terrell. Now, Jody used to be in the full-time ministry. He used to lead the Cross and Switchblade ministry over in Hawaii. He had a great prominence amongst all the brothers and churches over there. And then when everything hit, because his faith was locked into the church and God, his faith crashed and he totally fell away. Now, in the midst of all this, his wife stayed barely faithful. Her name's Ui. And then she got thyroid cancer. I mean, here's all this that's happening to her. She's just barely hanging on. But then she hears about Joseph and Mary. And she goes to be a part of it. She says, oh, wow, this is awesome. She hangs in there month after month after month. Now, get this. Then Jody's mom joins the church. And she's fired up. So we'd gone there a few months ago. And I got with Jody for the first time. And we hammered out some of the scriptures, and the next morning, his mom came to me and said, I'm so happy he finally had a quiet time after five years. Well, but then he kind of slipped back. We came this next time. Kyle and I studied with him for three straight days. And on Sunday, he was restored to Jesus Christ. Now, the amazing, the amazing thing was that when he got up there, here is this big, he's, he's part Samoan. And, you know, if you know any Samoan people, Luis, you know, they're, they're, they're kind of like, like really big people. They're, I mean, they're really big. I mean, Kyle is tall, but I'm talking about broad-shouldered, too. You know what I'm saying right here? And, I mean, this guy gets on up there and just has a presence. And he gets on up there, and, and I know he wanted to speak powerfully, but then he starts crying. I look around, everybody's crying. He apologizes to God. He apologizes to the church. He pledges a sold-out commitment to the end. He apologizes to his wife. We sing to him, and then his wife just runs up to him, and his three little girls, 10, 8, and 6, just run up. They're all crying, and they're all hugging daddy. I'm telling you, I started to cry. I mean, it was... I mean, it was, it was just unbelievable because you saw Jesus changing someone that everybody thought just couldn't change. It was very interesting. It was Elena that figured out what was going on, why his heart was so hard. We had dinner the first night there. We were just talking about this, talking about that. He hadn't got into any really what we call bad sins. And Elena, you know how Elena, she hangs back just a little bit and then like that. And she goes, you know, Jody, I think your problem is, the reason your heart is so hard is that you can't forgive yourself for falling away. Wow. Here we are at the dinner table. Our tears are starting to come, you know. She says, you can't forgive yourself, can you? She's just going at it like that, you know. <laughs> she says, that's pride. Yeah, I, I kind of scooted back right about that point. <laughs> it 
it was, it was, it was powerful. But you see the value of why we need disciples in our lives. To say the tough stuff that sometimes we, we have just built up so many layers to we don't even know we're so deceived by our sin. And that was it. He, he, he felt so bad that he had gotten out of the ministry. He'd quit the ministry. He'd quit the Lord. He, he'd quit being an example for so many of these people that he pulled out from very rough backgrounds. And worst of all, he'd let down his wife and let down his little girls. And he couldn't forgive himself. But we said, listen, Jesus has died to forgive you. And now you can forgive yourself. If you don't, you're denying the blood of Jesus. On Sunday, it was like we had taken off this load off. He had gone in peace. It was unbelievable. It was just one of those moments. And I really believe the Lord is going to raise up that, that little family to do powerful things. And you know, it was really amazing. Not only did we see the great things in Hilo and Hawaii, but even during our three-day break there in Maui, we got with a, a couple that had fallen away. And once more, we, we talked to them about really coming back to the Lord and coming to the Jubilee. Lord willing to be coming to the Jubilee. Amen. And I said, well, well, Kip, you know, we hear great things about Hilo. We hear awesome things about Honolulu. When are you going to start a church here on Maui? I said, as soon as you guys repent, then we can go for it. <laughs> you know, it is amazing what God can do. This guy, Jesus, there was no one ever like him. No one that had the faith. No one that had the hope. And no one that had the real love that never failed. But in order to receive those things, one had to have an unworthy faith. One had to be willing to have the unexpected hope. And one needed to be unpretentious and not worried about what everybody thought when they came to Jesus. You see, anybody that comes to Jesus, their life will be changed when they come in faith, hope, and love. Thank you. God bless.